Now I'm going to begin by briefly reviewing anatomy of the secondary pulmonary lobule. Some of the abnormalities we identify, we identify because of abnormalities of the pulmonary lobule. And this is a radiograph of a lung slice of two adjacent pulmonary lobules. And what we can see are the lobules being marginated by connective tissue interlobular septa. These contain pulmonary vein and lymphatic branches. In the center of the pulmonary lobule is a branching centrolobular artery and it is large enough to see on high resolution CT and adjacent to it is the centrolobular bronchiole which is too thin walled to be seen in normal subjects. Pulmonary lobules range from one to two and a half centimeters in diameter and characteristically have this polygonal shape. Now this is the high resolution CT finding of interlobular septal thickening. What we identify is a reticular pattern and we can identify this reticular pattern as due to interlobular septal thickening because the lines we see outline what we can recognize as pulmonary lobules because of their characteristic size and shape. And one of the, way we, one of the ways we recognize these as lobules is the centrolobular artery, which is usually visible as a dot or branching structure in the center of what you think is a pulmonary lobule. And then within the interlobular septa themselves, we often can make out septal veins and these, these may be dot-like or occasionally branching. Interlobular septal thickening, in this case, it is due to interstitial pulmonary edema, certainly a common cause of that abnormality. Well, what do you do if you see interlobular septal thickening on high res CT? Well, first of all, you ignore it unless it is the predominant abnormality because a little bit of septal thickening will be very common in almost any diffuse lung disease you see and unless it predominates, it's of no value in differential diagnosis. Interstitial pulmonary edema is a common cause. Lymphangitic spread of neoplasm, a common cause. There are some other uh, infiltrative diseases that result in interlobular septal thickening, but they're relatively rare, and I'm not really going to go into those in detail. An example would be amyloidosis, something of that sort. And patients who have diffuse lung fibrosis can show interlobular septal thickening, but it is characteristically irregular in contour, and usually we have other findings of fibrosis that we rely on to make the diagnosis. Well, this is simply a chest film in a patient who has pulmonary edema, and you can see curly B lines. Curly B lines are the plain radiographic appearance or plain radiographic correlate of interlobular septal thickening as we see it on high res CT. Now, here is another patient, a high res CT shows smooth thickening of interlobular septa. You can see a number of thickened septa within the right lung. The left lung looks relatively normal, so this is at least asymmetrical and probably unilateral in distribution. That would be quite unusual for interstitial pulmonary edema. Here a lower scan in the same patient. Again, we see thickening of interlobular septa within the right lung and not on the left. Also a right pleural effusion is uh, evident posteriorly. This is the other common cause of interlobular septal thickening we see, lymphangitic spread of carcinoma. This is a patient who has lung cancer and the septa are thickened because of lymphatic infiltration. This is a uh, lung slice in a different patient who has lymphangitic spread of carcinoma, but you can see thickening of the interlobular septa by tumor cells, and this results in this characteristic appearance of asymmetrical or unilateral septal thickening. The next finding I'm going to talk about, another reticular abnormality is honeycombing, and I think you can recognize this uh, as honeycombing. It's a very nice example. And this is a patient who has usual interstitial pneumonia UIP due to the lung disease idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis IPF, and we'll talk further about both of those. Now I'm going to digress for a moment and talk about the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. They're an important group of lung diseases that you need to know about. These represent reactions to lung injury. The interstitial pneumonias are pathological responses of lung to injury. They are not diseases per se, but they are ways in which the lung can react when it is injured. They occur in several patterns with variable inflammation and fibrosis. They have a variable response to treatment and they may be idiopathic or may be associated with collagen disease, may be associated with drug treatment, 
Uh, inhalation, there are a number of other causes as well, but keep in mind that these idiopathic interstitial pneumonias may be idiopathic or they may not. They may be associated with some other uh, disease. Now these are the interstitial pneumonias or idiopathic interstitial pneumonias as currently accepted. These are UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia, NSIP, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, OP or organizing pneumonia. Uh, DIP, disquamate of interstitial pneumonia, quite similar to another entity termed respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease, and then LIP, lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, and AIP, acute interstitial pneumonia. Now the first four of these are common, and we see these first four on a regular basis in our clinical practice. The last two are not so common, LIP, uh, often associated with collagen disease, and I will show you an example of that in my last slide. And AIP, acute interstitial pneumonia, is basically idiopathic ARDS. Uh, if someone is in the ICU with ARDS and they don't know why, it may be AIP. And generally speaking, AIP is something that's evaluated with plain films in the ICU on a daily basis and not with high-resolution CT. Okay, now the American Thoracic Society, ATS, and European Respiratory Society got together and classified these interstitial pneumonias in 2001 and agreed on some terminology because we tended to use different terms in uh, the United States than were used in England and Europe, and this is what they agreed upon. First of all, they made a distinction between the histologic pattern of the interstitial pneumonia. Remember, an interstitial pneumonia is not a disease, it's a histology and then the idiopathic clinical syndrome associated with that interstitial pneumonia. And the histologic pattern of UIP, when it is idiopathic, is called IPF, or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. The histologic pattern nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, when it is idiopathic, is called idiopathic NSIP. The histologic pattern organizing pneumonia, when idiopathic, is called COP or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, although sometimes in the US we refer to it as idiopathic boop. The histologic pattern disquamate or DIP, disquamate of interstitial pneumonia, uh, when idiopathic is just called DIP. Now, what this classification did not emphasize, but I'm going to emphasize now, is that each of these histologic patterns may be associated with a given disease or, or various types of diseases. UIP may be a result of collagen diseases, drugs, asbestosis is basically a UIP pattern. NSIP, very commonly associated with collagen diseases, may be a drug reaction, other causes as well. Organizing pneumonia has lots of causes, it may be post-infectious, collagen diseases, drug reactions, inhalation of fumes, may be seen with hypersensitivity, pneumonitis. And in the vast majority of patients, DIP is associated with cigarette smoking. So these may be idiopathic or they may be associated with disease. Okay, we'll start by talking about usual interstitial pneumonia. This is quite common in, uh, in clinical practice. The histology is heterogeneous lung fibrosis. What we see on high-res CT is reticulation, a finding called traction bronchiectasis, and honeycombing is seen in about 70% of cases. And this combination of finding, uh, findings is typical of this pattern. Ground glass opacity is very uncommon as an isolated finding. That means in areas that don't show findings of fibrosis. Uh, the abnormalities have a basal, posterior, and lower lobe predominance. That's very important in diagnosis. Idiopathic UIP is IPF. It has a very poor prognosis. Also, the differential diagnosis, as I have mentioned, collagen diseases, asbestosis, drug fibrosis, end-stage hypersensitivity, pneumonitis may be associated with UIP on histology. Now, this is a lung slice, a sagittal lung slice in a patient who has UIP associated with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And what you can see on this path specimen is honeycombing with a posterior lower lobe predominance. This is a lung slice in a patient who has honeycombing, and just to emphasize what this means, honeycombing indicates the presence of cystic lucencies. These are air uh, containing, these are empty holes, so they should look absolutely black on high-res CT. Three to 10 millimeters in diameter most of the time, but may be larger or smaller. They must be seen, and I emphasize that, must be seen in a subpleural location or you can't be sure they are honeycombing. Unless you see these subpleural, they may be something else. 
Early on, you will only see a few isolated cysts. Later on, cysts occur in several layers and cysts share walls when numerous. And these have a tendency to occur in clusters and they're not simply black holes, they have a recognizable wall surrounding them which is fibrotic. This is the plain film appearance of a patient who has UIP-IPF. Uh, what we tend to see is a decrease in lung volumes, the lungs look small, and at the lung bases you see an increase in reticular opacities, although usually you can't figure out exactly what it is you're looking at. This is the lateral view, and again you can see reticulation that predominates at the bases and in the posterior costophrenic angle. Another example of honeycombing on high res CT, again we're seeing black holes. These look to be a little less than a centimeter in diameter. They're occurring in clusters and layers. They have thick recognizable walls. This is a very good definite example of honeycombing in a patient with UIP IPF. Another example with a posterior lower lobe predominance of reticulation, traction, bronchiectasis, and a little bit of honeycombing, UIP, IPF. Differential diagnosis of honeycombing is basically the differential diagnosis of UIP. The histologic pattern usually associated with honeycombing that we see on high res is UIP. Differential is IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, collagen diseases, particularly rheumatoid and scleroderma, drug-related fibrosis, methotrexate or something like that, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, asbestosis uncommon in clinical practice these days, end-stage sarcoid can be associated with honeycombing as well in a few patients. And I should say that fibrotic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, NSIP, the different interstitial pneumonia may also be associated with a little bit of honeycombing, but it typically has a different appearance. Now I mentioned that reticulation and traction bronchiectasis is a finding we see in UIP. It's a finding that indicates the presence of fibrosis. This is what I mean by traction bronchiectasis. These bronchi are very irregularly dilated. They appear corkscrewed because of fibrous tissue that's pulling on their walls and making them dilate. This is not airways disease. It is fibrosis causing the bronchi to dilate. And they have this very, very characteristic irregular appearance and will be associated with reticulation as we see here. And this is a lung slice in a patient who has uh, UIP IPF. And we can see a very nice example of traction bronchiectasis in the posterior lung. And also this patient has honeycombing, which you can see in the subpleural region. So this finding of reticulation and traction bronchiectasis also associated with this disease and with lung fibrosis in general. Now let's talk about IPF. It's a very common disease and it's the most common cause of UIP. If you have this disease, if you have IPF, then your histology must be UIP. Patients are usually older than 50 at diagnosis. They have progressive dyspnea. Mean survival only about three years, five year survival 25 to 40%. Having IPF is basically like having lung cancer. It's a disease that is very difficult to treat and uh, not very responsive. Now recently, the American Thoracic Society, European Respiratory Society, uh, Japanese Respiratory Society, and Latin American Thoracic Association got together and they decided on criteria for making a diagnosis of IPF. And this is very important because this is a common disease. And these are the criteria that they came up with. And this was just published this last year. Number one, exclusion of known causes of ILD that means exposures, connective tissue diseases, drug toxicity, things of that sort. So basically this first criteria means that the disease is idiopathic. Number two, a UIP pattern seen on high resolution CT. That is all you need to make a diagnosis of IPF with this current classification. It's idiopathic and high res CT looks like UIP, the diagnosis is IPF. Lung biopsy usually not performed in that situation. If a lung biopsy is performed, and as I said, it's not usually done, then various combinations of high-res CT and histologic patterns are used to reach a final diagnosis, and I'm not going to get into that. What I want to emphasize is idiopathic disease, UIP on high-res CT, the diagnosis is IPF. <laughs> 
Now, this is what they mean by a UIP pattern on high res CT. UIP pattern, a subpleural basal predominance of abnormalities. Okay, we've seen that. Reticular abnormalities, we've seen that. Honeycombing, and then no inconsistent features. And I'll tell you what those are in a second. If those four criteria are met, then it's definite IPF, or definite UIP pattern. Possible UIP pattern is exactly the same thing, but without honeycombing, okay? So honeycombing necessary to make a definite diagnosis of a UIP pattern. Now here's an example of a UIP pattern on high res CT. There's reticulation in the upper lobes and in the mid lung zones, but the disease predominates at the lung bases in the posterior subpleural lung. There's reticulation, we can see little irregular reticular opacities here and there, and then we see honeycombing. There are no atypical features, so this is a UIP pattern. If this person has no known associated diseases, this is IPF, period. Now here is a patient with a basal posterior subpleural predominance of reticulation, but no honeycombing. This would be diagnosed as possible UIP using those same criteria. And usually a person like this would have a lung biopsy for final diagnosis. This was early UIP IPF. Now, what are the inconsistent findings? What are the findings that tend to rule someone out? Well, these are findings that tend to go with some other disease. An upper mid lung or peribronchovascular predominance. That's not what you see with UIP. Extensive ground glass opacity. That's something like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Profuse nodules, sarcoid or something. Discrete cysts, well, that'll be histiocytosis or LAM or something of that sort. Mosaic perfusion air trapping, that's some sort of airways disease or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And then consolidation, which is a BOOP finding or organizing pneumonia finding. So these inconsistent features are things that are typically seen with some other disease. Well, here are a couple examples. This is a patient who has uh, great honeycombing. It's subpleural predominant. There's a lot in the lung bases. Uh, so this is a UIP pattern, but this patient has rheumatoid arthritis. So this cannot be IPF because he has an associated disease, and we would call this rheumatoid lung disease. Here is a patient who shows a great example of honeycombing in the lung bases, so that looks like a UIP pattern, but also recognize that he has calcified pleural plaques and he is asbestos exposed. So because he has this exposure, this cannot be IPF, but it is a UIP pattern, and we would call it asbestosis. Okay, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. <clears throat> this is less common than UIP, and this is a specific entity despite its name. You may have heard at, the, at AFIP that NSIP does not exist. That is wrong. NSIP is a real disease. It is a specific pattern despite its name. The histology is homogeneous inflammation or fibrosis, unlike UIP, which is heterogeneous. It occurs in two forms, cellular and fibrotic. It's common, very common in patients with collagen vascular disease. Also occurs with drug reactions or may be idiopathic and has a good response to treatment with five-year survival, 80 to 90%. What we tend to see on high res CT is ground glass opacity and reticular opacities uh, in some sort of combination, but ground glass is often a predominant feature if you see ground glass opacity alone in patients with this disease, it is the cellular form. If you see ground glass opacity plus reticulation, it's either cellular or fibrotic, you can't be sure. If you see traction bronchiectasis in association with reticulation, since that's a uh, finding that tends to go with fibrosis, fibrotic NSIP is likely. And if you see a little bit of honeycombing, then it's fibrotic NSIP. And I should mention that in distinction or in contradistinction to UIP, honeycombing is quite uncommon in fibrotic NSIP and when present is quite minimal in extent. So you don't quite see the same appearance you do in UIP. It also has a lower lobe posterior and peripheral predominance, but it has a specific finding that is extraordinarily helpful in making this diagnosis and that is sparing of the immediate subpleural lung which is present in 20 to 60% of cases. Now here an example, a 43-year-old woman with dyspnea for three months. Prone scans show ground glass opacity with a 
peripheral lower lobe predominance, but notice that the immediate subpleural lung is less abnormal than lung a couple centimeters away. That is subpleural sparing. That is a finding that uh, is very, very highly predictive for NSIP. And this is concentric left lo uh, lower lobe brown glass, subpleural sparing, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Another patient looks just the same. A little bit of reticulation and ground glass opacity in the peripheral lung and posterior lung, but notice subpleural sparing. Classic NSIP. Now here is a patient who shows reticulation and traction bronchiectasis. So the reticular opacities here, these little holes are dilated bronchi seen in cross-section. That's traction bronchiectasis. I'm not calling this honeycombing because it's not subpleural. Maybe that's one honeycomb cyst right there, but honeycombing is inconspicuous in this disease. Notice that there is relative subpleural sparing. The lung immediately adjacent to the pleura is less abnormal. This is a classic example of fibrotic NSIP. So we're seeing reticulation, traction bronchiectasis, not so much ground glass opacity, subpleural sparing. And here another example, reticulation and traction bronchiectasis with subpleural sparing, fibrotic NSIP. Now these are survival curves on top for NSIP, survival curve over what, nine years? And this is the survival curve for comparison for UIP IPF. And you can see that IPF has a much worse prognosis than NSIP of all sorts. And if you distinguish cellular NSIP from fibrotic NSIP, cellular NSIP much better than UIP, fibrotic somewhere in the middle. Now, here are two classic examples of the two interstitial pneumonias I've talked about so far, UIP and NSIP. These are uh, the appearances you should look for in trying to distinguish these two diseases on your left honeycombing at the lung bases, classic UIP pattern, likely IPF. On your right, we're seeing ground glass opacity with subpleural sparing, classic NSIP. Okay, the third interstitial pneumonia, respiratory bronchiolitis and disquamate of interstitial pneumonia, almost all cases uh, related to smoking. Respiratory bronchiolitis is a very common histologic abnormality in smokers. Uh, if you have a patient who's a smoker who's getting a lung biopsy, you can bet that they will have RB on biopsy because all smokers do basically. If that histologic abnormality is associated with symptoms, uh, it is called respiratory bronchiolitis interstitial lung disease. If the disease is much more extensive, it's usually called DIP. It's a similar histology, but much more extensive in distribution. DIP much less common than the other interstitial pneumonias I've talked about so far. I don't see very many cases. Treated with steroids or smoking cessation and prognosis is good. And you can uh, almost count on the fact that someone who has a diagnosis of DIP will continue smoking and take steroids. Respiratory bronchiolitis and, D and DIP. Histology is intraalveolar macrophages with very little fibrosis, ground glass opacity is what we see. Patchy or central lobular nodules tend to predominate in uh, patients who have the entity of respiratory bronchiolitis, interstitial lung disease and ground glass opacity is more diffuse in DIP, maybe patchy or subpleural distribution, it's variable. This is a 56-year-old smoker, and you can see here there's sort of patchy ground glass opacity. Maybe if you use your imagination, you can see that some of these ground glass opacities have a central lobular predominance. This is respiratory bronchiolitis. Here's a patient with much more extensive ground glass opacity, and these little cysts tend to occur in people that have DIP. I'm not sure exactly what they are, probably areas of air trapping or little nematoceles or something like that. But this is a typical appearance of DIP in a heavy smoker. So if you know your patient is a smoker, these entities are something to consider, but they're not very common, and they don't generally pop up in my differential unless I know the patient is a heavy smoker. Okay, back to high-res CT findings. We'll talk for, uh, first about consolidation. Consolidation means increased lung opacity with obscuration of underlying vessels, and that is distinguished from ground glass opacity, where the lung is increased in attenuation, but you can still see vessels within the abnormal lung regions. So if it's entirely white, it's consolidation. If, it's, uh, if you can still see anatomy in the abnormal region, it's ground glass. 
differential for consolidation depends on the duration of the patient's symptoms. It's a very simple way to approach it, but it's the way I do it. Uh, if the symptoms with consolidation are acute, then you think of pneumonia, pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, or diffuse alveolar damage, which is the histology of ARDS. If you see consolidation in patients with chronic symptoms, and by that I mean six weeks or more, uh, then I think of organizing pneumonia, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, and we, what we used to call diffuse BAC, bronchial alveolar carcinoma, but the name is in the process to being changed to invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma. That is a change that's occurring. BAC is not a term we're going to be using in about a year. I'm not even using it anymore now. Mucinous adeno. So, here a patient with lupus, acute dyspnea. The finding is consolidation. Symptoms are acute. Differential diagnosis is pneumonia, edema, hemorrhage, something of that sort. This was pulmonary hemorrhage. 73-year-old with pneumonia and fever for six weeks on treatment. So these are chronic symptoms. The finding here is consolidation. Differential diagnosis is going to be different, and the things I think of first are going to be organizing pneumonia, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, which is basically the same as organizing pneumonia, and then diffuse, I was gonna say diffuse bronchial alveolar carcinoma, invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung. And this was organizing pneumonia with patchy consolidation, a very typical finding. Okay, we'll talk about organizing pneumonia for a second. The histologic pattern is granulation tissue polyps and bronchioles associated with patchy organizing pneumonia. Organizing pneumonia is associated with a syndrome often known in the U.S. as BOOP. The ATS ERS prefers organizing pneumonia or COP as terms to use. I, I generally say organizing pneumonia unless I'm among friends and then I love to say BOOP, as you know. Quite common idiopathic infection, drugs, collagen diseases, fume inhalation are various causes. Several months of cough, dyspnea, and low-grade fever are typical. These patients often appear as if they have a pneumonia that hasn't been adequately treated. It responds well to steroids, has a good prognosis, five-year survival, basically 100%. High-res CT findings, patchy airspace consolidation or ground glass is seen in uh, most large nodules or masses. Peripheral and peribronchial distribution is typical. These areas of consolidation are in the subpleural lung or around the central airways. The opacity is often quite irregular in shape. Findings of fibrosis uncommon and mild. And there's a finding that is particularly suggestive of this entity, and it may be called the atoll sign, uh, but more typically or commonly referred to in the literature as the reversed halo sign, uh, common with organizing pneumonia. Uh, this is a patient with amiodarone treatment who has progressive dyspnea. What we're seeing are areas of consolidation which are peripheral and peribronchial, very irregular in shape. This is a great example of organizing pneumonia as a drug reaction. And this is the atoll sign. What we see here are areas of consolidation that are rim-like, and then ground glass opacity in the center, or here crescents with ground glass opacity, here a very funny shaped one with ground glass opacity in the middle. Uh, this is the halo sign, which I'm sure you've heard about, a dense central nodule surrounded by a halo of ground glass opacity, commonly seen with angioinvasive aspergillosis. And this appearance is sort of the exact opposite of the halo sign, which is why it has been referred to as the reversed halo sign. But also, I think it very strikingly resembles an atoll, and this term actually appeared in the literature first, although it happened to be in Italian. But this is an atoll, and I have this down from my own residence because only about half know what an atoll is. A ring-shaped coral reef enclosing a lagoon and surrounded by the open sea, and the atoll itself often has a few breaks in it so the tide can go in and out, and these often have breaks in them. And this looks whiter than it does on the outside, which is what an atoll sign looks like as well. But as I said, my residents don't generally know this. Apparently, they don't spend quite as much time in Hawaii as does the faculty. Organizing pneumonia. If you see this atoll sign, very, very highly predictive for uh, organizing pneumonia, although it can be seen with a few odd infections as well. 
And these are pictures from the literature of the reversed halo sign in COP or cryptogenic organizing ammonia and in this study that was seen in about 20% of cases, but you can see these little atolls uh, quite nicely. Now chronic eosinophilic pneumonia may be idiopathic or associated with a known antigen. Peripheral eosinophilia usually present. Symptoms are about the same as for organizing pneumonia. Asthma is a common association. It is basically identical to organizing pneumonia in CT appearance and symptomatology. We see peripheral ground glass opacity or consolidation. This tends to have an upper lobe predominance and rapidly responds to steroids. And there's a good deal of overlap histologically and clinically in everything between organizing pneumonia and eosinophilic pneumonia. Uh, some pathologists think, they're, think, think they are the same thing, basically one with eosinophilia and one with less eosinophilia. Uh, but keep in mind that this is a different thing that can look exactly the same. This is a patient with two months of cough and dyspnea. We see these areas of consolidation peripheral and uh, peribronchial. Some of these look like they're showing an atoll sign, but this person has a peripheral eosinophilia and this is chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. Looking exactly the same as organized pneumonia, and again, these are probably the same thing. And here a patient with months of progressive cough and shortness of breath, a lot of consolidation here on both sides. This is invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma of the lung, again, formerly known as BAC. Uh, with consolidation. And in patients who have this tumor, what's going on is the tumor grows along alveolar walls with a pattern termed lipidic growth, but the tumor cells produce mucin and fluid and that fills the alveoli and causes the consolidation that we see on CT. It's not the tumor that causes the consolidation, but the mucin. Okay, this is ground glass opacity. Now what we see again is increased lung opacity, but vessels remain visible in the abnormal regions. Air bronchograms may or may not be seen. This happens to be good pasture syndrome with pulmonary hemorrhage. Now this is an appearance of normal alveoli, and ground glass opacity may result from alveolar wall thickening, partial alveolar filling, decreased alveolar air. Each of those can result in ground glass opacity as we see it on CT. And here, courtesy of Photoshop, I have done that. Here I have thickened the alveolar walls. That will result in increased tissue within that voxel. That will appear as ground glass. Here I have filled some of the alveoli with a pink proteinaceous fluid. That will result in increased attenuation in ground glass. And here I have shrunk down that piece of lung to a smaller volume. That will also result in increased attenuation. Now I approach the differential diagnosis of ground glass opacity exactly the same way I approach consolidation based on the chronicity of symptoms. If the patient has ground glass on CT with acute symptoms, differential is pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, atypical pneumonias, diffuse alveolar damage. Basically the same differential, but you consider different sorts of infections, atypical instead of bacterial. Patient with acute dyspnea, sort of a parahylar bat wing appearance to ground glass opacity. This is diffuse alveolar damage due to cocaine or crack lung. Chronic uh, symptoms with ground glass, the differential diagnosis is uh, a lot longer and more complicated. It includes interstitial pneumonias such as NSIP and DIP. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis, a very common disease, organizing pneumonia. Chronic eosinophilic pneumonia, mucinous adenocarcinoma again, lipoid pneumonia rare due to aspiration of lipids, and alveolar proteinosis. Here a patient with three months of progressive dyspnea, so chronic symptomatology with these multiple areas of ground glass opacity, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, again a very common disease. Now hypersensitivity pneumonitis is caused by inhalation of various organic antigens. Uh, the responsible antigen, however, can only be identified in about half of cases, even if you try really hard. It occurs in acute, subacute, and chronic stages. Repeated exposures cause, cause fever, chills, dry cough, and dyspnea. Symptoms are progressive over months or years, and chest radiographs just totally unhelpful in making this diagnosis. Now, typically, patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis present in the subacute stage. And the 
appearance that we see on high res goes along with the histology that is present. It's a very nice correlation. These patients have an alveolitis with alveolar wall infiltration, and that appears as diffuse or patchy ground glass opacity. They have peribronchiolar granulomas that are very ill-defined, and those result in the appearance of ill-defined central lobular nodules of ground glass. And they also have a cellular bronchiolitis that causes mosaic perfusion, and that's patchy lucencies with air trapping. These may be diffuse or predominant in the mid-lung zones, and involves the entire cross-section of lung as, and does not have a subpleural predominance as do some of the other interstitial pneumonia. So here we see a patient with dyspnea for months. We see these patchy areas of ground glass opacity. We see lucencies that probably represent mosaic perfusion due to air trapping. The disease involves the entire cross-section of lung, geographic ground glass opacity, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. 66-year-old bird fancier with progressive dyspnea, a very, very similar appearance. We see a rather diffuse ground glass opacity appearance, but then these lucencies, these areas of mosaic perfusion or air trapping, this one looking just like a pulmonary lobule, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, very typical appearance. These, this is an expiratory view in the same patient, and you can see air trapping within these pulmonary lobules because of the bronchiolitis that is associated with this disease. Now in patients who have chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, typically we see reticulation and traction bronchiectasis may be a little uh, honeycombing. There is no subpleural predominance and upper lobes are often most abnormal and that's quite distinct from the appearance you see in UIP or the other interstitial pneumonias, again involving the entire cross-section of lung. Now this is an unusual appearance of ground glass opacity, but I'll show it to you because it's quite typical. Patient with six months of progressive dyspnea, so ground glass with chronic symptoms. It's from that second list I showed you. This person also shows the appearance of crazy paving where interlobular septal thickening is associated with the ground glass. And I should say as a disclaimer that you may see crazy paving in any cause of ground glass opacity, acute or chronic but the appearance of crazy paving has become associated with alveolar proteinosis uh, because it is a very typical appearance in alveolar proteinosis, but it is a nonspecific high res CT finding. If I see it, I might suggest this diagnosis, otherwise I would almost never suggest alveolar proteinosis as a diagnosis in any case I see, just so rare. This is the histology of alveolar proteinosis and it goes along with the CT, what we see is filling of those alveoli with a proteinaceous material causing the ground glass, and then that same material accumulates with an interlobular septum causes the, uh, the crazy paving appearance. Okay, diffuse lung nodules. Now, when we see nodules as the predominant abnormality on CT, uh, we can characterize the nodules into one of three specific patterns, and that helps with differential diagnosis. And the three patterns are perilymphatic, random, and centrolobular. This is the appearance of a perilymphatic distribution of nodules. And with this pattern, nodules occur in relation to lymphatics. They predominate in three places, in the subpleural lung adjacent to fissures and peripherally, adjacent to central bronchi and vessels, or peribronchovascular, and lastly, within interlobular septa. So this is the typical distribution and location of nodules with this pattern. Because it occurs, or the nodules occur only in these specific regions, the overall appearance tends to be patchy. Differential diagnosis, sarcoid, almost all, 95% of cases at least are sarcoid. Lymphangetic spread of tumor, silicosis and co-workers pneumoconiosis uncommon, amyloid rare, lymphoid interstitial pneumonia rare. Again, 95% of patients who have a perilymphatic pattern have sarcoid. This is a nice example. Subpleural nodules peripherally. Subpleural nodules adjacent to the fissure. This is a photograph of the surface of a lung in a patient with sarcoid, and you can see these subpleural nodules quite easily. Here, peribronchovascular nodules, another typical finding with a perilymphatic pattern and with sarcoid. A lung slice in a patient with sarcoid, the nodules predominate around the central bronchi and vessels. <coughs> 
Mediastinal nodes are seen in up to 90% of patients with sarcoid. Hilar nodes also very typical. The nodes are symmetrical and are described as having a one, two, three pattern on chest film. I'll show you that. Lung disease is seen on chest film in about half of cases, many more on high-res CT. Uh, what we typically see are perilymphatic nodules, most subpleural and peribronchovascular, with an upper lobe predominance. Uh, we see upper lobe masses, big conglomerates of sarcoid nodules associated with little nodules around their outside. Those are satellite nodules, and that has been called the galaxy sign. And later, uh, upper lobe fibrosis, fibrotic masses, and traction bronchiectasis result along with cysts and emphysema in some patients. So this is the characteristic one, two, three pattern of sarcoid, right mediastinal, bilateral hyalur. Sometimes you see nodes in the AP window that is sometimes called a one, two, three, four pattern, but typical adenopathy in sarcoid. In patient with sarcoid here, we can see a lot of lung disease as well, many nodules in the upper lobes in addition to Hyler prominence. A patient with sarcoid here, extensive subpleural and peribronchovascular nodules and masses, and these are conglomerates of uh, sarcoid granulomas. Uh, this appearance with large masses and little nodules around the outside or satellites has been called the galaxy sign and is quite suggestive of this diagnosis. In, in, in people that have end-stage uh, sarcoid, basically where you have the active nodules, it all turns into fibrous tissue and you often get these fibrotic masses in the upper lobes with traction bronchiectasis. And here on plain film, typical appearance of sarcoid with fibrosis, bilateral, symmetrical, upper lobe fibrosis, some cysts and emphysema, but these irregular masses of fibrous tissue in relation to the hyla. And sarcoid has a propensity to be associated with aspergillomas, a very common association. And here a patient with fibrotic sarcoid and these upper lobe masses of fibrous tissue with traction bronchiectasis. And here a cyst or an area of emphysema on the left with an aspergilloma inside it. Now the appearance of sarcoid can be mimicked by silicosis or co-workers pneumoconiosis. And here a patient with simple silicosis showing subpleural nodules and peribronchovascular nodules. This is a patient with uh, complicated silicosis where fibrosis has occurred in relation to these nodules and you get these upper lobe masses that look very much the same as fibrotic or end stage sarcoid. Complicated silicosis and here the CT that could be associated with that appearance. Again, these masses of fibrous tissue associated with traction bronchiectasis in the upper lobes uh, in patients with complicated or progressive silicosis. And here's some calcification occurring in relation to those. So sarcoid and silicosis can appear quite similar in the active stages or in the fibrotic stages. And another finding you may see in either sarcoid or silicosis, but is more typically or classically seen with silicosis is eggshell calcification, where you see this little rim calcification of mediastinal or hyalur lymph nodes. The second pattern of nodules is termed random. Random distribution relative to lung structures, they occur anywhere and everywhere. You see subpleural nodules in this pattern, but they're not, there's no predominance in the subpleural regions, an overall uniform distribution. Differential diagnosis is hematogenous disease, miliary tuberculosis, miliary fungal infection, hematogenous METs. And sarcoid, when the nodules are extremely uh, numerous, can mimic this appearance of a random pattern. Now here are a good example, diffuse nodules, uniform lung involvement, subpleural nodules present, miliary TB. This a lung slice in a patient with miliary TB, it's just this very diffuse distribution with nodules also seen at the pleural surfaces. And on plain radiograph, these numerous small discrete nodules typical of miliary TB. Another example, miliary coxy and AIDS, diffuse lung distribution, subpleural nodules present, but diffuse and uniform lung involvement. And here a patient with an adenocarcinoma that is metastatic to lung, there are nodules at the pleural surfaces, but diffuse and uniform lung involvement. So random pattern is hematogenous disease. Now the third pattern of lung nodules we can see is central lobular. And with this pattern, the nodules are occurring in relation to the central lobular bronchial or artery. The most peripheral nodules you see adjacent to a fissure or adjacent to the chest wall are about five millimeters away from the pleural surface. 
That's where the centers of the lobules are. Now, because lobules are about the same size, a central lobular pattern appears diffuse and uniform. But keep in mind that with this pattern, you do not see nodules at the pleural surface as you do with a random pattern. And the overall appearance in different diseases diffuse or patchy. Now, a very quick algorithm that lets you distinguish these three patterns, multiple nodules, no pleural nodules present, it's a central lobular distribution differential diagnosis, small airway or small vessel diseases, subpleural nodules present with diffuse and uniform lung involvement, it's a random pattern, random pattern and hematogenous disease, subpleural nodules with a patchy or non-uniform distribution, perilymphatic, usually sarcoid. Here's a patient with diffuse nodules. What is the pattern? Well, the lung is involved in a diffuse and uniform manner. Pleural surface is spared, so this is a central lobular pattern. The nodules are of ground glass opacity. That's very typical appearance for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Cellular, uh, central lobular nodules of ground glass opacity. And the histology associated with that here, an interlobular septum, a central lobular bronchiole, and then a nodule or nodules of, of ill-defined granulomas surrounding the bronchiole. Differential diagnosis of this pattern, well, it's a little bit longer than the others. Any form of bronchiolitis, uh, infectious or inflammatory, endobronchial spread of tuberculosis or mycobacteria, bronchopneumonia, any cause, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, respiratory bronchiolitis, interstitial lung disease, endobronchial spread of tumor, again, mucinous adenocarcinoma instead of BAC, Pneumoconioses can do it, silicosis in an early stage. And then uh, vascular disease is much less likely, but pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, or some vasculitis. Here a patient with bronchopneumonia, shortness of breath and fever. We see central lobular nodules here of soft tissue attenuation. Uh, so infection is certainly on the differential diagnosis high on the list when you see central lobular nodules. 27-year-old with cough, shortness of breath, and fever, a few cavities in the lower lobe, central lobular nodules. This is endobronchial spread of TB. Here, invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma or diffuse BAC with central lobular nodules due to endobronchial spread. So that, the differential diagnosis. Okay, a very important finding, and it's something I think Brett will probably talk about in the next presentation, is tree and bud. Tree and bud refers to the uh, an appearance we see when there is dilatation and impaction of central lobular airways uh, resembles a budding tree. If it did not resemble a budding tree, it would be a very stupid name, but it does. These uh, opacities tend to be centered five to 10 millimeters from the pleural surface because they're basically central lobular. The uh, branching opacities we see with this pattern is uh, more conspicuous than you see with normal branching vessels in the lung periphery and often tree and bud is associated with central lobular nodules as well. Now this is what tree and bud looks like in a drawing. This is what tree and bud looks like in a patient. We see this branching structure in the lung periphery that, is, that represents a dilated impacted central lobular airway. Uh, sometimes you see a little cluster of nodules or the, you see the buds better than the tree branches. Uh, basically is the same thing here. Another nice example of tree and bud in between the two. Now basically, if you see tree and bud, as we see in this case, uh, it's going to be an infection. We reviewed a number of these a, a few years back, and every case we looked at with tree and bud had some sort of infection, very uncommon in non-infectious airways diseases. So if you see this appearance, and it's a very characteristic appearance, you can bet that the patient has some sort of airway infection. A patient with AIDS-related airways disease, airways disease due to chronic infection, Beautiful examples of tree and bud in the right lower lobe. If I see that, I know I'm looking at an infection. This is a lung slice in a patient who has this sort of bronchopneumonia. You can see these airways impacted with uh, material in the peripheral lung causing this tree and bud appearance. So differential diagnosis, endobronchial spread of TB or MAC, infection, 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 infection. Aspiration occasionally does this, not very common. I've seen one or two good cases. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis or asthma with mucoid impaction, not very commonly associated with this. 
and very occasionally it's reported with BAC. I have not seen a good example myself. Generally speaking, if I see tree and bud, my diagnosis is infection, and that's all I'm going to consider unless I have information to the contrary. Nice example here of multiple trees and bud in the lower lobes on a prone scan, beautiful branching opacities. I'm going to think this is infection, and it's pseudomonas bronchopneumonia. Okay, emphysema. We're almost done. Emphysema occurs in three forms, centralobular, panlobular, and paraseptal. And they have different appearances. Centralobular emphysema is nicely shown in this patient, and what you typically see are these black holes that are spotty and involve the upper lobes in a, in a sort of spotty fashion. That's a good way to describe it. They generally do not have recognizable walls, although you may see very thin walls in some patients. This is the appearance of centralobular emphysema on a plain film. We see upper lobes, again, this is an upper lobe predominant abnormality, uh, that are much too hyperlucent, uh, may be increased in volume as we see here, and have vessels that are very small or spindly. The second type of emphysema is panlobular emphysema. This results in, in almost total obliteration of pulmonary lobules themselves. And we tend to recognize this as lungs that are too big, too black, and have vessels that are too small. We do not tend to see the same sort of focal abnormalities, focal holes, like you do in centralobular emphysema. So this may be difficult to diagnose in early cases. Uh, everything just looks too big, too black, vessels too small. On plain film, what you tend to see is emphysema that is diffuse or has a basal predominance. This often associated with a basal predominance on plain film. You can see the lower lobes are quite lucent. And this is the type of emphysema that's associated with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. The third type of emphysema is paraseptal, and this occurs in the lung periphery, and you have these focal areas of emphysema that basically represent pulmonary lobules. They have walls that you can see, and those usually correspond to interlobular septa. This type of emphysema may be idiopathic or may be associated with smoking and centralobular emphysema, as we see here. But if you see this subpleural emphysema, you call it paraseptal. The last finding I'm going to discuss is lung cysts. Now, lung cyst is usually defined as a localized airfield lesion. I mean, you have bronchogenic cysts and things like that that have fluid in them, and they have that specific name. But in general, the term lung cyst refers to something that is air-filled. It has a thin but visible wall. It has a wall that's recognizable, usually allows it to be distinguished from emphysema, and is well circumscribed. Now, the differential diagnosis, well, honeycombing is a cystic abnormality. So when you say somebody has honeycombing, you are saying that you see multiple lung cysts in a subpleural location with a thick wall uh, occurring in clusters or layers. Emphysema, if you have a bulla in a patient with emphysema, it has a thick and recognizable wall. That is a lung cyst. So you cyst, the term cyst can be used with these diseases. If you have a patient with pneumonia who develops pneumatoceles like PCP, that is, the pneumatoceles are lung cysts. It's just a very general term. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis in some patients may be associated with cysts due to air trapping. <clears throat> but there are several lung diseases that are characterized by lung cysts as the primary or only abnormality. And these are quite rare. These are histiocytosis, lymphangiomyomatosis, LAM, and the lung disease of tuberous sclerosis. Those are quite rare. And Sjogren's syndrome or other collagen diseases associated with lymphoid interstitial pneumonia or LIP, also relatively rare. But these are cystic lung diseases, and I'm distinguishing these from these more common causes of lung cysts that we can usually diagnose as what they are. Now, this, first of all, is a patient who has these patchy areas of ground glass opacity and then multiple lung cysts in the upper lobes and obviously a pneumothorax because one of the cysts has popped. And uh, let's say this person has acute symptomatology, which he probably does because he has a pneumo. But if we see ground glass opacity in association with acute symptoms, we think of pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, atypical pneumonia. And this patient has AIDS, and this is pneumocystis 
with nematocele. So this is a disease we're going to be diagnosing not based on the cysts, but based on the clinical presentation and other findings that we see. This is histiocytosis, again, a primarily cystic lung disease. Uh, Thick-walled cysts are seen in this patient, and they're quite typical. And you can see that the cysts are fewer in number and smaller in size at the lung basis, and that's quite typical of histiocytosis. And the cysts also have very irregular shapes, which is characteristic of this disease. So cysts irregular in shape in histiocytosis, thick or thin-walled in different stages of the disease, and you can see that these are thin-walled at the base. There's an upper lobe predominance in size and number. In early cases, you may also see nodules in association with the cysts. And this is a smoking-related disease. Uh, only people that have, in adults, who develop histiocytosis that looks like this, uh, the disease is associated with cigarette smoking. Here's another patient, Langerhans histiocytosis. Notice on a plain film, we're seeing some upper lobe lucency. The pulmonary hyla are large because this person has pulmonary hypertension associated with this. These are the CT scans. You can see cysts being irregular in shape and larger in the upper lobes than at the lung bases, although the bases are also involved. Uh, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. And this is this patient's lung removed at lung transplantation. And you can see that there are numerous cysts in the upper lobes. Cysts predominate in size and number compared to the lower lobe. This is a 21-year-old smoker with cough. Notice that in this patient, we're seeing nodules and we're seeing thick-walled cysts that are rather small in size. And we're seeing a few things you might call cavitary nodules. This is Langerhans cell histiocytosis in an early stage. This is when you're seeing nodules and before the cysts, or just as the cysts are starting to develop. So there's a, the progression in Langerhans histiocytosis, nodules, cavitary nodules, thin-walled cysts. 35-year-old woman, uh, lungs are large and lucent. This is a high-res CT seen through the upper lobes in this young woman. This is lymphangiomyomatosis, or LAM, with cysts. Lower lobes, cysts are just as big and just as numerous. So characteristic of cysts in LAM, they're round in shape, not irregular like uh, histiocytosis. Usually thin-walled, as we see here, the wall's pretty thin. Diffuse in distribution, both upper and lower lobes. These occur only in women of childbearing age. I have seen one man with LAM. It was associated with tuberous sclerosis. Otherwise, these are all women that are childbearing age, sometimes older. This is not going to go away if you go into menopause. Uh, you occasionally present later on, uh, but usually childbearing age. 1% of patients with tuberous sclerosis show this sort of appearance rarely in men. And here, the Cysts at baseline, two years later, they're bigger and more numerous, and this is her lung at lung transplantation, diffuse lung involvement. And the last case, a 72-year-old woman with Sjogren syndrome and lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, <coughs> excuse me, LIP. We see thin-walled cysts, usually in people with this disease, LIP, lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, with uh, cysts. The cysts are countable. Uh, usually limited to a couple dozen. If I made a resident count these, it would be possible. Not possible with histiocytosis, not possible with LAM, but you can count the cyst typically in a patient with LIP, in association with collagen disease. Cysts round in shape, thin-walled, diffuse, limited in number. A few dozen is quite typical. <clears throat> 